in FFR, the FFR was 0 0.72, so we decided that we would uh, go ahead with um, extensive plantation in the proximal segment. Um, that's, uh, that's the IVS evaluation. You could see that the distal vessel is 3.25, proximally it's 4.2. So we decided that we'll go with a 3.5 mirrors and post elective 4.4 millimeter balloon. And you could see that there is the, even though angiographically it was not looking critical, the plague burden is so huge. You could see that plague burden is so significant. There is calcification over there, 90 degree arc of calcification. It is more of a fibrotic plague and the minimal luminal area was just 3.1 millimeter. We dilated it with uh, a, a, a 3.5 millimeter bellow and tracking the scaffold was not difficult. And in the second image, you could see that the scaffold position there, we wanted to pull back the scaffold a little more proximal to bring it back near the osteal LED. We were very careful in doing that. Uh, we, uh, millimeter by millimeter, we tried to pull it back, but at some point of time, what happened was now the guide catheter just lurched inside and what happened following that was the scaffold got, got dislodged little distally and the balloon came back little proximally. So you could see that the balloon is proximal to the scaffold and thanks to Merrill, thanks to Merrill, the, the markers are so good, you can easily pick up, you can easily make out that the scaffold has got dislodged, which was not really possible with us with the first generation scaffold. So these markers, with the help of these markers, it was well visualized. And so the next challenge was what to do next. We decided that we deploy it over there and then have a metal stent, uh, a 12 millimeter metal stent proximally deployed. So what I did was I tried to disengage, disengage the guide catheter and slowly pull back the balloon. So I was very fortunate that when I slowly pulled back the balloon, the scaffold also came back and it reached the area where I wanted to deploy the scaffold. And so I was very lucky I deployed the scaffold there that's the scaffold being deployed at 16 atmospheres and then took a new balloon so that the distal end of the scaffold was not open well. So that was also uh, properly deployed and then further post dilatation with 3.5 millimeter balloon. Following post dilatation with 3.5 millimeter balloon, we did an IVS evaluation. The, the lumen area was not so good. So we went ahead with a four millimeter post dilatation and you could see that the minimal luminal area was still 7.6. It just made me feel that there was a little bit of under expansion. Probably there was a fibrotic lesion, there was a calcification. I should have gone with a, uh, with a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon for a better lesion preparation, but I didn't do that. So I ended up with a minimal luminal area of 7.6. Also did an I was uh, also did an uh, RFR, which was good. Uh, getting in the RFR wire, the wire was a bit difficult, but then we managed to get it display and the RFR was good. And uh, so we stopped the procedure. The final result was good. The flow was good. So my learning point following this particular case is probably when I find a fibrotic lesion or a calcific lesion, I should prepare the lesion very well before going in with the scaffold inside. The markers are well visible compared to the first generation scaffold and in fibrotic lesion, I was a bit worried about the radial strength and little bit of recoil. So in closing, dear friends, my learning following these particular cases would be imaging pre-procedure and post-procedure is mandatory at least during the early course of deployment of this device. And trackability of the scaffold is good while positioning of the scaffold. May, uh, keep in mind that uh, the proximal end of the scaffold is 1.2 millimeter proximal to the marker. Do not undersize. It might be difficult to get the post dilatation balloon inside. Always deploy good pressures. Post dilatation to 0.75 is recommended. Beyond that, there should be a possibility of scaffold fracture. But from today's lecture, we understood that the chance of scaffold fracture is going to be very less. Regarding recoil, radial strength, we need more data. Post dilatation is always preferable because we need a perfect result we we need you cannot have a compromise i thought that this this device like the like the first generation scaffold it's also not so forgiving but we heard from dr dr sasko's uh, lecture that the second generation device is more forgiving compared to the first generation device and finally do we have a lot of data with this particular device probably this is our our stent it's an indian stent it's an indian scaffold we need to generate lot of data. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Hi. Deepak, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Hi. Now, uh, you heard of longitudinal compression with metallic stands when you're pushing uh, bigger balloons. What happens to these uh, scaffolds if you're trying to uh, push a balloon and you're not going easily? I mean, is there any OCT analysis for that and can you go under the strut, if your wire is under the strut, any, any data, any analysis? Professor Saskai also can jump in here. Yeah. 
yeah i felt that this is more of a rubbery thing because we we got an opportunity to have a feel of the scaffold when you push it and pull it you have the malleability and all is good so if you push it i goes in and like the metal stand probably comes back to the original position so the so i thought that the longitudinal compression is going to be less likely with this and in this particular two cases what i showed you the last two cases we had some challenge in getting the balloon inside the post dilatation balloon inside the scaffold segment but in spite of that at the end of the procedure you could see that the markers are really not compressed the mark markers are really wide apart and uh, and you and uh, ocd wise also it was looking good so i felt that the chances of longitudinal compression are is going to be less likely with this device compared to the metallic stents i would i would also like to hear from dr dr sasco yeah i fully agree with your statements uh, definitely you are right uh, but what is very important message now that uh, we should not treat device in terms of uh, aggressive crossing through the calcified and very fibrotic lesions as a metallic stent so the structure of the device is not a metal uh, it's pretty tractable pretty good deliverable device but we should not be aggressive in calcific lesions if they are not well prepared so first of all we have to be sure that we have a very good lesion preparation and a very smooth access and definitely we cannot be aggressive too much aggressive going through a calcific lesions in order to prevent uh, some dislodgement and uh, device deformation it was yeah. very well depicted in a cases in a, in a cases from a deepak it was a great great talk uh deepak can i make a comment yes sir uh deepak uh, very nice cases i think very well uh, demonstrated all the things which uh, one should do but in your second case uh, uh, like when you were start, uh, doing the second flex uh, where uh, you saw that uh, the balloon was slipping up and down so uh, as you also said uh, in the end you see whenever the balloon is slipping up and down you see that you can very fibrotic and always prepare the bed before going with the scaffold these the scaffolds are uh, in a way they are not metallic stents so we have to prepare well in this scenario i think choosing a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon at that point would have been a much better idea than going ahead with the deployment of a device and then going inside with a high pressure balloon you see high pressure balloon also helps only if you have to prepare the bed very well and in your in the third case with the rca you were the, uh, deployed the stent and nothing was going i think from the very beginning i would have been uh, like with a, with a, the guide that you took in the end right you saw the guide was always back in it was not the scaffold which we did not expand and the balloon is not going it's but that nothing is tracking even you took a guide zilla nothing is tracking down so it is the guide support which was lacking in your case that led to the uh, whole thing rather than anything else and in that case also you saw that the lesion was fibrotic and the bed surface was not very good before deploying the device so my, my the next talk is mine and I'm, uh, uh, i'm very aggressive with that and i have a good uh, good data for from the bioabsorb uh, data also and i had a good exposure to about 1000 devices i put in myself and a very good result still i am missing the device because when the device was taken off and i'm still seeing some follow up with my ocd everything is fine there's nothing wrong with the with the device so this the device was basically marketed to aggressively uh, they just said that anything anywhere you can go with the bbs no it's not my in in those era my first slide would have been if you are in hurry please do not deploy a baby you will end up in a trouble right often they were leaving the edges which were beyond the marker undilated and recrossing would have been very difficult if you leave those edges undilated and again in your uh, in your uh, last case uh, where the led you were doing uh, with the uh, with the pulcar dislodge again the same thing is that it means the lesion process is not well otherwise these devices do not slip uh, balloon does not come back very very easily they are very very well uh, fitted on that and it means the lesion process was required much more than what we did in the york that's my comment like uh, uh, the things yeah. will be different but the end results were very nice in all the cases but still i would be more aggressive in preparing the bed well before any scaffold whether it is 100 microns or 150 microns does not make much difference because there is no metal there it's only this like uh, the other things like there's only a pla which is supporting you uh uh yeah yeah, yeah dr pravin i would i would definitely yeah. yeah i would definitely agree with you lesion preparation is definitely the key i would agree with you that's my message also 
it has to be extreme one has to be extremely cautious regarding regarding preparation of the lesion and regarding the balloon moving forward and backward because whatever cases we have done we have just done 3.5 or bigger vessels we have never done in a vessel that is less than 3.5 mm because we felt that at least early during the course of deployment probably we should be choosing bigger vessels it will be more forgiving compared to smaller vessels so that is the intention now all these uh, pre dilatation balloons are 4 10 mm long so when you use a 10 mm long balloon in a, in any huge vessel it's going to melon feed here or there so that is what i was precise like in fact yeah, if yeah, i indicated yeah. sanjeev probably we need to have little more longer balloons for pre dilatation right thank you uh, so what do you know uh, i think you can share your screen uh, you are a co host i probably yes yeah, uh, yeah. shall i okay. yeah yeah please sir Okay. Uh, can you see my slide, please? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So my talk is very very simple. I'm just uh, showing up two of my cases which I've done recently, and the basic aim is to choose a lesion and then do a good job. It takes time. It's not like a metallic stent that you you just put in a stent and come out. So let me just uh, go on the next one. Right. My first patient is about uh, is 26, uh, 30, 46 year old male. He's a diabetic. hypertension he has been a smoker still smoking he had a first angioplasty to om and led about 7 years back with metallic stent in both om and led led was proximal and om was mid segment recently he came to me with typical angina with the last three plus two months and see angiogram his rfi is unremarkable You see, in in circumflex, whoever did the job, they put in a bifurcated stent where the smaller branch of stent is closed off. Does not mean much to me. The main stent, the circumflex is still flowing fine. And if we just have a look, the LED stent is doing reasonably well. This is which is here. It's a it's a four-row stent, it's doing fine. And this is a new lesion which has come up in the circumflex. But the looks of it, he's a diabetic, young patient. These all lesions are very fibrotic. They do not give way easily. Let us see the next shot. LED is doing fine. Now see the second slide. It looks easy. Looks like just go with the balloon and do that. No, these lesions are very hard. So I have my usual practice. It's an XB guide and an all-star wire. I am just uh, preparing my like uh, lesion to for a for a cutting balloon to go in. So I set 2.25 balloon to just make the room for a cutting balloon. And now, if we just go to the next one, that's a balloon dilatation. And now comes the cutting balloon. So that's the three uh, three point two five cutting uh, three cutting balloon initially. It's a reasonable dilatation. At about say maybe about I go very aggressive about say sixteen because I'm undersizing the cutting balloon. So I'm going about 16 or 18 atmospheres on a cutting balloon. I took a shot. Still not happy. You can see some cuts here in the distal part of the lesion. Went ahead again with the cutting balloon, slightly more aggressive, about 18 atmospheres, and a different direction of cutting. And now it's a good cut, cut made. Now I've taken a picture with an OCT. Just have a look. It's a previous stent which has been well deployed and well endoplasmized. It's about seven years back. Now we are entering the lesion. The cutting balloon has has done a good job, and you you can see a lot of fibrosis which has been there all along. And good cuts have been made. Now my my bed is ready for for my like a scaffold. Let's see the picture. Yeah, you can see all 
fibrotic areas and they have good cuts made by my cutting balloon and cutting balloon was very aggressive not again a device it's a three and a half device three and a half 19 and very peculiar picture is about see this device these markers and as you also deepak mentioned that about 1.2 millimeter of the scaphole is outside and this marker is just point one millimeter ahead of it means this is very well very well matched balloon to the scaphole so you can really go high pressure without any any problem right so i deployed my sense at say about maybe 14 atmospheres. And then post letting the device with a say there's three and a half balloon very aggressively. And taking care of the margins also. In the center where the main lesion was there. Initially, this was a 3.5, and again, 3.75 balloon inside. And at really good atmospheres, what maybe 25, 27 atmospheres, because I really go very hypersensitive on these devices whenever I'm taking a scaffold. And now, see the picture the OCT picture. You see, Area 3.16, 3.16, 3.53, MLA is about 7.88, 9.78. Very good deployment of this pen of the scaffold. Even we can't see a single strut hanging into the lumen. So recently done case, the guys who doing reasonable with the clean Kalpala. And we'll just do maybe a second gram, maybe in six months' time. These are the pictures we have taken. Like in the end, the scaffold is all along very, very smoothly deployed. And there's no, I can't see much of uh, the under expansion. And if you see the MLA is 6.84, 6.96, and about, say, 10.61 at the proximal edge, just looking wonderfully well. Now, second case is again a 60 year old male. Again, he's diabetic hypertensive. And I tell you, these diabetic hypertensive, these lesions are very fibrotic. He had an ACS about a week back, increased toponin level. Echo showed mild inferior hypokinesia, EF is about 55%. Hi, doctor. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. The lesion is like almost uh, nearly occluded artery. And as we just make some room there, it's a regular wire on a 1.5 minute Babylon. And see this, this lesion appears to be very, very fibrotic. The way it is appearing to me because it's a diabetic person. So it's a two minute double to create some room there for my OCT to go down. Now it's an OCT picture. You can see good fibrotic areas all around. And just see, this is a appears to be some white thrombus sitting inside the lesion. There's a small chunk of calcium here and there, but nothing major. Mainly it's fibrosis in the RC. So seeing that fibrosis, we've taken some like measurements, mm -hmm. like uh, if you see that this is about 2.61, proximal is about 3.82. And uh, we can see these pictures with thrombus sitting here, all fibrotic areas are sitting here. So now it's again cutting balloon. It's an optimally sized cutting balloon around three cutting balloon at about nominal pressure is about say 12 to 14 atmospheres and a good cutting all around. Now see this one. This is the hardest point where the lesion is completely occluded. 
So the cutting balloon at about say 12 atmospheres is not giving way. So you rotate the cutting balloon and see the next picture. Oh, sorry. Let me just go back. See this. It's completely open now. So now you know this cutting has been made a good good dent there, and the good cutting is there to just uh, make my sense expand. Now it's a scaffold, which is uh, three into thirty-two, deployed at about fourteen atmospheres, and we can be safely going to hyper because see, the marker is just point one millimeter outside the scaffold. So safely you can go to slightly higher pressure than what is required or what is needed, right? Without any like uh, having a danger of uh, this talent for further effect, now the OCT picture. The scaffold appears well deployed. But see, Distally, the vessel is about 3O, area is about 7.3, but in the center where the lesion was there, the ML is coming at 5.25, it's about 2.57 uh, millimeter diameter only. Possibly it is looking all right, 3.19, and area is about 8.03 millimeter square. So it needs some more job to be done. So you can't leave it here. So it was a 3O spent, and ultimately we went up with a 3.5 balloon, which is supplied with a with a like box of the Maris, and it's a non-compliant balloon. So we went ahead with that balloon, and you can see we are quite ahead, about 7.25 minutes ahead of that, so that we are we are not missing any part of the scaffold not being dilated. Right again, proximally also you're doing a good job, and about the atmosphere is about say 23, 25 atmospheres, and now see the OCD picture. It's really wonderfully well. I'll show you the picture. This area was coming around 5.5. Now it's about 6.82, and the diameter is about 2.92, approaching 3. And these are also 3.17 and 3.33. And you can see the scent is very well deployed, like all along. You can't see any area of under expansion. And I tell you, these devices behave very well if you prepare the bed very well. See the measurements all across, like lumen area 8.8, 6.82, 8.17, 7.92. And all along, you can see the deployed stuff. You can't see any area which is like uh, showing the under expansion of the stuff. So, to me, to conclude, let me just uh, go to the last slide. Stable case is the first prerequisite for BRS therapy. Like uh, the patient has to be stable because you know that you have to make uh, some room there, you have to go high pressure. Often these lesions which are patients acutely sick where you are scared of going high pressure will not be the right choice. Proper blood preparation with imaging guidance, preferably an OCT, is useful and has key to success and adequate results. Adequate post dilatation with non-compliant balloon is mandatory. Adjective ascent is very important to dilate as the scaffold is outside the metallic marker. In Meras 100, the scaffold is about 1 to 1.2 millimeter outside the metallic marker. And the balloon is hardly 0.1 millimeter beyond that. So it's like going on high pressure with the, with the same balloon is not a problem. And image guided post dilatation is preferred. Thank you. For, thanks for attention. So thank you, sir, uh, Dr. Kareev and other co-chairs. If any comments, please. So if not, uh, thank you once again, sir, uh, for the excellent case presentations. I would also like to thank all our uh, doctors who have presented excellent cases with BRS. Uh, now it is a time to shift our gears. And now we are switching uh, to our our course of talk. Uh, for that, I would request Dr. Sigitas, if you can share your screen, sir. You are the first speaker and you are going to talk about your experience with MyVal uh, 
So, sir, can you share your screen? Okay, we can see your screen, sir. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for the uh, invitation to give this uh, talk. Um, in my talk, uh, I will try to share my experience, and uh, I think I will try to let you get into my head that um, that I'm going uh, to think about everything that uh, I need to go into the cath lab. So first of all, uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, every single patient needs a, a right valve. And uh, we have lots of uh, different kind of valves uh, in the in the market, but today I'm going to uh, concentrate a little bit more on the my valve, and uh, I will let you know why uh, I think this one uh, this valve is one of the uh, best of, uh, on the market. Uh, so when you have to uh, deal with patient with uh, with aortic stenosis, you have to think about the different things uh, going into into the cath lab. So first of all, you have to get uh, a patient with indications for TAVI. You have to get uh, uh, interventional cardiologist with experience in, in the TAVI program. You have to get uh, equipment and materials. And then you have to think about uh, uh, patient-specific uh, considerations. So first of all, when you, when you start your TAVI program, you have to think about the measurements uh, of the aortic analysis. You have to think about the calcification and the access. Um, and then you are happy to do the procedure. But then when you, uh, but when you become more experienced, you have to think about uh, different things. And then uh, out of that, it goes the decision why you have to choose uh, the right valve for the right patient. So when I go to the cath lab and when I have a patient, I think about this patient's uh, LV size and function. Uh, because when you have bad LV function, you know, don't want to prolong your procedure with repositioning the valve and you don't want to prolong the procedure in, in either way. You also have to think about the valve size, um, valve func other valve functions, uh, ECG changes, because uh, as you all know, uh, ECG changes may lead to a uh, pacemaker and we try to avoid it. Uh, also coronary artery disease, if you have bad coronaries and uh, you want to re uh, redo uh, cats uh, later on, you have to think about the access for, for, for these coronaries. And also patient, uh, patient's age is a very important issue in, in this case, because if you have a young patient, you have to think about this plans uh, for the future. It might be a valve and valve in the future. You need to think about the uh, coronary access uh, in these patients as well. So um, uh, I would like to share uh, three of my clinical cases with, with my valve. And I will try to show why did we choose this valve. So first patient is 84 years male with a permanent uh, pacemaker implanted previously uh, with a knee YHA class three, recent uh, LAD PCI, good LV function and severe aortic stenosis. So if you look on the, uh, on the measurements, uh, so perimeter of the analyst is uh, even oversized uh, uh, for, for the largest valve on, uh, on the market. Um, other, uh, otherwise, uh, all the uh, <clears throat> measurements are quite okay. If we will see on the on pictures, uh, you can clearly see that uh, it's not true tricuspid valve. So we thought that even with a large anatomy, we would rather uh, implant the valve as a uh, bicuspidish valve. So we'll try to make sure that we will anchor our valve quite high, um, a little bit uh, touching the, the, the analyst, but uh, we tried to fix the valve in the, into the leaflet. Uh, on the, uh, uh, regarding the access wise, there was some uh, aneurysms in the um, iliac arteries, but uh, nothing very serious. So we thought that we can uh, do the procedure with my valve 32 pl uh, with plus two cc's uh, into the uh, uh, navigator balloon. Uh, usually we do the uh, punctures on the uh, echo control, but regarding uh, these aneurysms, we thought that it, it would be useful to do the angiogram before the procedure. Uh, just make sure that we have uh, compared images uh, after all. So we placed uh, uh, one proglide, we placed stiff wire and entered with a Python sheath. 
which is 14 French balloon uh, self expandable uh, uh, sheath, which can accept all sizes of uh, my valve. Uh, before, uh, we tried to enter the, the valve uh, and successfully from the uh, first few tries. So we did the uh, angiogram. Uh, we saw the, the, cult uh, the calcification. We, uh, we saw the hole. So we proceeded with the, with the case. We crossed the valve. We thought we will not do pre dilation in this case because we have we wanted to get good anchoring of the uh, of the valve. Uh, we used the uh, benefits of this navigator system. We crossed the arch quite easily, and then we tried to cross the valve because of this horizontal aorta. It was uh, a little bit difficult to do that, so we tried to different maneuvers. We tried to flex and unflex the system uh, for a few times. Uh, stiff uh, sapphire wire uh, helped us uh, to enter the ventricle uh, and we did the angiogram to show uh, to see the uh, uh, height of the uh, of the system uh, so we were happy about the position of the of the valve and the rapid pacing of uh, 200 with the partial infl inflation within the angiogram uh, we were happy about the height of the valve and we proceeded to full inflation. So as you can see on the non-coronary cusp side, the valve moved a little bit higher. We aimed for that because, because of this uh, uh, larger cusp of, of non-coronary uh, side. So we thought it would be quite good for, for the anchoring. Uh, we did the angiogram with pigtail inside so we can see some uh, regurg on the, uh, to the LV. Then we try to remove the, 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 the pigtail and uh, regurg is uh, smallish. So we were happy with the result. Even in this high, uh, even in this large anatomy, you can place the valve safely with no, re uh, with no uh, stenosis, with no residual gradient and with no uh, severe regurg. Um, so we did the uh, angiogram after the procedure. So everything was okay and the patient was discharged uh, two days after the uh, procedure home. Uh, the second patient is 71 year old male with no coronary artery disease uh, with a, uh, NYH8 class two with Timoma. We talked with surgeons and they were not really uh, keen to do the surgery. And also the patient didn't want to get open heart surgery. So we, uh, we went for the, for the title procedure. So when we did the measurements, uh, there was nothing suspicious. Uh, all the measurements are <clears throat> suitable for a 29 valve. But when we look for the calcification, it was a disaster. So we thought, okay, so we, we need to do something. Uh, Self-expandable valves might be not a good choice for, for this uh, chap. So we thought probably my valve can, I can do the job. Uh, if you look at MROs, uh, it looks like highways for, for the procedure. So we decided to do my valve 29. We, we started the procedure and, uh, and at this time we thought that pre-dilation with 26 balloon uh, may help us cross the valve later on and it will help to open the, uh, uh, the valve. As you can see on the left uh, corner cusp, there's still an indentation of the, of the balloon because of the severe calcification. Uh, we had no issues crossing the valve with, with the liver system. Unfortunately, we didn't save the uh, implantation image uh, in this case. Uh, why, when we in, uh, implanted the valve, we saw that there was indentation uh, on the non uh, on the left corner cusp side. So we thought we will post the lead with the same balloon, uh, and this changed the situation a little bit. Uh, we did the angiogram later on, as you can see here, there is no regurg, uh, no residual uh, stenosis. So one more patient done. The third one, uh, I was a little bit skeptical about this one at the beginning, uh, but our team decided to, to proceed and uh, you will see why. So this was 81 years old female with diabetes, with borderline changes on the ECG and uh, with a bad LV function, severe aortic stenosis. Uh, we did the measurements. Also, uh, it, it quite uh, 
uh, normal. But then if you will see to the images here, so you will see that there are chunks of calcium or at the annulus level, uh, which are on a very high risk of uh, annular rupture. And uh, I thought it would be better for this uh, lady to do a, a self expandable uh, uh, valve implantation, but the team was keen to do uh, to proceed with a, with a balloon expandable, so we chose uh, my valve 26. Uh, because of these uh, calcifications in the aortic annulus, we decided to do pre dilation with the smallest balloon that we have. So we did the pre dilation with 20 uh, with 18 millimeter balloon. And with a valve. So after pre dilation, we checked the uh, position of the valve, and there were no uh, issues regarding implantation. We did, uh, we did implanted uh, the the valve in a in a in a position with a partial inflation angiogram and then uh, full inflation angiogram after the case revealed a good position of the uh, of the valve. You can still see the calcification around the uh, around the valve uh, around the prosthesis. And uh, we didn't get a significant residual gradient. So in, in, in conclusion, I think that the right patient for my valve is the, all the patients with large annulus because it can cover uh, very large perimeters and uh, areas. You can also use this valve for severe calcification as you could see in, in, in my two cases, even with, a, with calcification at the annulus level with a, these chunks of calcium uh patients for the high risk pacemaker also are good candidates because you try to place my valve quite high not to interrupt the uh, connect uh, connection of the uh, av node um, because of the uh, fast deployment the the valve is good for patients with a bad lv function and coronary artery disease if you have young patient and you need to uh, get to the access to the coronary arteries uh, because of this uh, low frame, it, it is easy to do. And also Python sheath, which is uh, put in French uh, self-expandable sheath, which can accept all the um, myval sizes, also is useful for, 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 the, for the procedure. So thank you once more for the uh, invitation to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Segitis. So any comments from the co-chairs? Okay. So if not, then uh, thank you, Dr. Sagitas, once again. And uh, with thank this, uh, we'll invite Dr. Ravinder Singh Rao. Uh, he's going to talk on tower in aortic regurgitation. Where are we? Sir, uh, you can share your screen. I made you a co-host. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we all can hear you. That was a great talk by Dr. Sigertas and he showed some really excellent cases. So congratulations to him from my side. And uh, uh, in all his cases, the deployment and the implantation was right on spot. And this is how we started with the first in man case and we took it forward that the implantation has to be very high in order to avoid the pacemaker rate. Uh, so, I mean, can he hear me? I just wanted to ask him a question in one of his cases where he added 32, he put in a 32 valve with three cc's extra. Yeah. Hi, doc Dr. Sigertes. Uh, we haven't met, but uh, uh, nice to see you. So the, the yeah, case, hi. the case, you know, that, that case with large analysts, which you uh, did by adding three cc's extra, uh, to the 32 millimeter valve. Uh, first of all, congratulations uh, for pulling off those uh, complex cases. Uh, uh, did you notice anything abnormal with the leaflets on a follow-up echocardiogram uh, of that patient uh, where you added uh, extra three cc's in a 32 millimeter valve? So the, the case was done last week. Okay. 
Okay. So we haven't uh, seen anything uh, unuseful, uh, um, unusual. So I think when the patient will come back in one month, uh, uh, we will get some uh, more data. But uh, till now, we didn't uh, see anything uh, unusual. So the valve uh, functions quite uh, really good, and uh, there is no uh, no regurg. So thank you, Varinder. The reason is I asked you this question. You know, we keep facing these questions from a lot of operators where, you know, uh, the question is if you stretch too much of a balloon expandable valve, uh, can the leaflets uh, start leaking? Will that coaptation uh, uh, distance, will it come down? Even in my own practice, I haven't really seen that happening. Practically, to me, it looks like more of a theoretical question. What do you? What What is your comment on that, sir? So I think that you know, the cooptation, uh, uh, the cooptation size is uh, very important in this case. But uh, adding two CTs is not very uh, big difference uh, comparing with the, with the with the size of the natural valve. Uh, we are going to do some cases with a really large anatomist in the pulmonary cases, and then uh, maybe there we will see some uh, regurg issues in, in these cases. But you have to keep in mind that uh, pulmonary and aortic uh, pressures are very different. Yes. So uh, uh, the, the future will show how the, these valves works in, in, in these unusual situations, I think. Thank you very much. So I'll go... Uh, further with my talk, Taver in patients with severe aortic regurgitation, where are we? Uh, let us try to understand the basic difference between annulus of an AR and annulus of an aortic stenosis. As you can clearly see, uh, the uh, annulus in an aortic regurgitation patient is dilated and more elliptical, and in the aortic stenosis, it is more elliptical and calcified and rigid. But the challenge is absence of calcium on the leaflets in, ER, in aortic regurgitation. And, you know, so sometimes there is no anchoring zone. The leaflets are not calcified. There is no calcium in the LVOT. There is no calcium in the annulus and annulus is big. And you can also see the clear difference in the ascending aorta uh, of a patient who has severe pure aortic regurgitation versus patients who have aortic stenosis. So basically to do a tower in a severe aortic regurgitation, the anatomy is a more uh, challenging challenging for the operator. But this is the uh, biggest data which is published, safety and efficacy of TAVR in treatment of pure uh, native AR and pure and failing surgical bioprocesses. So I'm not going to focus on the surgical bioprocesses because we know it's easier. But let us look at the demographics of patients who had pure AR. So you see standard age was 74, but the average STS score of these patients was 6.7 seven plus minus 4.8. So clearly at present with the current available devices, uh, a tower in severe AR is to be only offered to a patient who is prohibitive for surgical AVR. And the mechanism of AR in these patients, majority of cases was degenerative AR. So general anesthesia was used in 63% of patients. TF approach was in 65% of patients. The devices which were used was Corval, Evolute, Jena, Directo, Lotus, Sapien 3, and Sapien XT. So Jena valve is the dedicated valve for uh, pure AR. The contrast was 182 ml. But let us look at the uh, outcomes. New pacemaker implantation was 18%. And delivery of the device was possible in 97% of cases. And residual mean gradient was less than 20 in 97% of patients. Again, there's high all-cause mortality at 30-day, high incidence of stroke, high incidence of major vascular complications, high incidence of acute kidney injury in patients uh, who received older generation transcatheter heart valve compared to the newer generation transcatheter heart valve for uh, pure aortic regurgitation patients. Again, clearly in uh, pure aortic regurgitation, the mortality in TAVR patients is high compared to the TAVI, which is being done in patients with severe aortic stenosis. So what are the predictive factors of mortality and persistent NYHA class three and four at 30 days after TAVR in pure AR? Clearly see BMI of less than 20 AF, 
LV and diastolic dimensions of more than 55 mm, high STS score, pulmonary hypertension, new left frontal branch block, and a residual moderate aortic regurgitation or greater at discharge predictive 30 day mortality. So, again, this was uh, uh, the inference which was drawn from this paper that travel from for pure native regurgitation remains a challenging condition. However, newer generation transcatheter heart valve show promising outcome. Then acceptable results may be achieved in selected patients who are considered high risk for conventional surgery. So at present also, TAVR is not a class one or a class two A treatment or a two B treatment for pure AR. It is only offered to patients who have prohibitive risk for surgery but those candidates should be suitable for a TAVR procedure. So let us look at a patient, 59-year-old female, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, IT, patient had ITP, on steroid, severe aortic regurgitation, recurrent admissions with NYHA class 3 and 4, and patient was a surgical turndown, mainly due to ITP, steroid, frailty, and presence of chronic kidney disease. These are uh, the uh, parameters. So let us look at the CT scan of this patient. The area of the annulus is 514. The area derived diameter of the annulus is 25.6 and the LVOT size is 26.3. So I have very few, uh, very small experience of doing TAVR in AR only for patients who have a surgical turn down. So I'm just going to share my own uh, little experience. What we do is if a patient's LVOT and the annulus they have a same dimension, probably TAVR can be attempted in such type of patients. But if the LVOT is very wide and the sinus of Valsalva also very wide, those patients are not suitable candidates for TAVR using the current, current generation valve. Because in pure AR, the anchoring is not going to happen at the leaflet level. It is better to have the anchoring slightly into the LVOT and then also at the level of annulus. So we selected a 27.5 mm my valve, which was 21% oversized in this patient. Here again, clearly you can see on the CT scan, no calcium at all, uh, pure aortic regurgitation, uh, some uh, kinking which is present in the uh, descending thoracic aorta, however, no significant gradients. Uh, adequate size iliac vessels. And this is the aortogram uh, done with around 10 to 15 ml of the dye, which shows grade 4 aortic regurgitation. So I'm going to go with the uh, standard steps. This was already discussed in the previous uh, cases as well. Use the navigator system. So the way to position the my valve or uh, in a pure AR regurgitation is now you want to implant it a little deeper so that the anchoring starts from the LVOT till the level of annulus. And the inflation is maintained slightly longer. So you can clearly see with the level of pigtail, you can implant it a little deeper into the LVOT. So one important picture which is missing from this uh, uh, presentation is the way to implant is, as how it was shown by uh, Dr. Sigetas as well, you put the pigtail, do a rapid pacing, and then inject 10 to 15 ml of dye. That dye is going to hang at the root because there is no effective cardiac output. So the dye will outline the entire annular plane and the valve can be deployed slowly. The other way to do is you can use another pigtail, park it in the left sinus, and then use it as a marker for the annular plane because there is no calcium at all and sometimes you can be easily misled in deploying this valve. So a 27.5 mm valve was deployed and this is the final autogram. I'm just gonna pause that, I'm gonna play this again. And you can see compared to the aortic stenosis uh, valve deployment, this valve is implanted a little deeper into the LVOT and that is how the anchoring will happen. You start anchoring from the LVOT till the level of anchors. So no aortic regurgitation, and this patient has completed almost more than a year of follow-up, no more hospitalization since then. Uh, she uh, remains frail because of her CKD and ITP, but no hospital admission since then. Peak gradient was, eight. that's around, uh, the peak, uh, post-procedure peak gradient was around 17, the mean gradient was eight. Take home message, 
cover for AR is only offered for prohibitive risk patients and the CT, the CT scan anatomy should be suitable. Uh, in my own opinion, if the LVOT is equal to the size of the annulus and the valve is around 20% oversized, such an anatomy is suitable and patients can be attempted and the TAVI can be attempted. But if LVOT is larger than the annulus and patient has pure AR, there is no calcification in the LVOT and the annulus and the ascending aorta is dilated, uh, probably a TAVI should not be attempted uh, with the current generation valve until unless a dedicated TAVI valve is available because such a patient, there's a high possibility that you might convert an elective high-risk case to an emergency high-risk case. But if patient has prohibitive risk, there are multiple ways to attempt. You put one valve and then you put another valve inside it. So deep implantation compared to aortic stenosis. So deep doesn't mean it's like deep, deep. It's just a relative term in relation to the valve when you implant an aortic stenosis. Rapid pacing with contrast injection to outline the entire annulus or use of two pigtails is more important. The valve oversizing should be more than 20%. Sometimes rarely two valves can be used. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, the remaining questions uh, or uh, issues we can discuss if there are any. Hi, Ravinder. Harish here. How are you? I, uh, absolutely fine. Alive. Good. So, a <laughs> couple of questions for you. Uh, what do you think if you have pure AR, would a self-expanding valve help with an oversize? Or do you think a balloon expandable is the right way to go in case we do it? So, I have a very small experience. I've used uh, all types of valve. So, you know, I cannot generalize it. It's just an anecdotal thing. But what I have seen is a balloon expandable uh, was better in my own experience. And the reason why I say is, so remember, because of pure AR, there is a lot of movements which is happening at the level of annulus. Now, if your LVOT and the annulus are almost of the same dimension and your valve is 20% oversized, you rapidly pace these patients at 180 to 200 and then inject, uh, let the dye hang at the root identify the annular plane and do a very slow inflation and maintain the inflation for at least five seconds. Now, coming to the uh, idea of self-expandable valve, the challenge which I faced in the self-expandable valve, again, you have to rapid pace. Even if you're deploying a self-expandable valve, you have to rapid pace in pure AR because if you pace, the diastolic period goes down and the uh, right. regurgitant volume goes down. But what was happening is every time you try to open it, uh, the upper part is still constrained and lower part was never coming in contact with the annulus. It would just dive again and again, again and again into the LVOT. But with the balloon expandable valve, I was able to make the entire contact from LVOT to the annular plane in one plane. So, I mean, it's as of now, you know, if you ask me very little experience, uh, I would still now choose a balloon expandable valve if the anatomy is suitable. Maybe we can have some input from Dr. Sigitas as well. Yeah, so that's a really great case. Uh, and uh, I really agree with your opinion that uh, when you have pure AR, the balloon expandable valve is the best choice. Recently, I had one case uh, with a really low cal calcium on the leaflets, mild stenosis and severe AR. Uh, we started with a uh, with a self-expandable uh, valve. We were really lucky that we implanted this from the first time because the, the patient crashed on the table because of the bad LV function. But but then if you if you have balloon expandable valve, the procedure is really short. Yes. So you you have you can you can do uh, different uh, depth uh, depth issues you can have on uh, in during the procedure. But if you struggle in plan the self-expandable valve because you cannot anchor uh, uh, the valve on, at the analyst level, so the procedure may be really, really difficult. And balloon expandable valve is a really good choice in, in these cases, I think. Yeah. Uh, second question for both of you. Is there a difference in measurement of annulus uh, with whether you change the phase for the uh, aortic regurg when you measure the CT or it's the same phase and for the annular measurement for deciding the valve? It's the same phase. You measure in the mid-systole 35-40% okay. 
And that is because the LVOT and the analysts are biggest in that space. Uh, but for, as I said, you know, I would never promote TAVI in pure AR. I want to be very, very clear. This is only for patients who are prohibitive risk for surgical AVR. Uh, but yes, in, we do see these type of patients in our clinical practice. And, you know, I have seen it makes a difference if the valve procedure goes very well. Hey, thank you. Uh, so there's one more question from Dr. R.T. Yadav on the chat box, and he's uh, talking about does deeper implantations in AR may lead to CHB? Yes. So this is a very important question, and this is what we discuss with the patient's family up front. Now, see, you are trying to treat a patient who is inoperable or prohibitive risk for surgery. You know, if you go ahead and treat the aortic regurgitation and the valve is functioning very well, pacemaker implantation uh, is a trade-off. Yes. So definitely a deeper implantation carries a high risk of complete heart block. But again, let me uh, stress again on that point. Deep does not mean it's a very deep implantation. I'm just talking relative to how you do an aortic stenosis. If you, if you saw Dr. Sigita's cases, all valve in the aortic stenosis was like zero depth. Zero means right at the annular plane. You're not even into the LVOT. You're not even touching the LVOT. And here it's like, you know, just like three to five, five mm into the LVOT. Provided LVOT is equal to the size of the annulus. If your LVOT is huge, a deep implantation will also not help because you'll never be able to touch the LVOT. 